Hello everyone. Um, so I'm Ahmed and today I will speak about uh, the convergence of local SGD on identical and heterogeneous data. All right, so this talk is based on the following paper, Factor Theory for Local SGD and Identical and Heterogeneous Data that uh, is going to appear in AI Stats 2020. And uh, we actually wrote two earlier workshop papers that uh, kind of deal with the same topic. And uh, the first one is actually on a slightly different algorithm, local GD, which I think is also interesting in its own right. But our topic today is on local SGD. Um, this is going to work with uh, Professor Peter, who introduced this talk, and uh, with Konstantin Mischenko, who is a PhD student at KOST. And it was done last summer when I was an intern there. So, all right, so the plan that we have here is that uh, we will have an introduction to the algorithm, we will motivate it, and this will last for about 20 minutes. And then we will present our theory. And just before that, we will also present our goals and contributions and so on. All right, so um, federated learning is uh, a distributed machine learning setting. Uh, where data is uh, distributed in a decentralized manner. So uh, this field has started quite recently, or relatively recently, but it already has many applications that have reached deployment, like mobile text pre uh, prediction, uh, applications in medical research, uh, in banking and elsewhere. And uh, there's this uh, paper, Federated Learning Strategies for Improving Communication Efficiency by Jakob Panetri, Brendan McMahon, Felix Yu, Peter Richteri, Ananda Suresh and uh, Dave Bacon. And uh, this really is one of the papers that started it. There is also a recent survey that uh, has a lot of authors and that also covers a lot of, a lot of the, the aspects of the field. And uh, federated learning actually is pretty interesting because it also poses highly interdisciplinary problems. So not only do we get the traditional machine learning problems, but also we get problems from privacy or from security because the main uh, problem that we're facing is not only that we have to learn a model, but we have to do it while respecting people's privacy, while respecting the, the fact that the data is distributed and we cannot centralize it uh, due to privacy concerns or security. And we also want to learn something that works well for everyone. And there are a lot of uh, ideas, but in, in today's talk, we will focus on optimization. All right, so the problem that we focus on is to minimize a function f that can be written as a stochastic optimi as, a, as a stochastic expectation. So what this means is that f can, uh, th is that we have a probability distribution and that we can uh, write f in terms uh, of an expectation over functions uh, in that probability distribution. So we assume that f takes uh, input in dimension D in, that lives in RD, and that F is smooth and mu convex. And uh, we also, as I said, we uh, assume that uh, F can be written as an expectation. And the prime example of such problems are finite sum minimization problems. These are ubiquitous in machine learning, and they typically arise out of empirical, out of trying to solve empirical risk minimization problems. All right, so now we explain the setting that we are dealing with, and that is a, a distributed setting in which we have a, a server that is connected to multiple clients. We assume that there are M such clients, and in this case, in this scenario, uh, the typical algorithm that is used as a baseline is called mini batch stochastic gradient descent. And uh, the typical application is called the parameter server in which, for example, we are training a model that uh, we, we like in the non-federated setting, this is just, we have access over all the clients, the server is ours, everything is ours. And in this case, many batch stochastic gradient descent is a very valid uh, baseline to use. And in this case, communication is a bottleneck because uh, it is well known that the cost of communication on, on, on modern hardware is uh, much higher than the cost of computation. Uh, but there is also uh, 
that there are two main regimes that we will be considering. The first one is called heterogeneous data, and this is the relevant regime for federated learning. So in this regime, uh, we have multiple clients, and each client comes with its own optimization objective. It comes with its own data set. You can imagine that each client is entirely different and doesn't know. And in a federated learning setting, for example, these could be two phones, and uh, each of them is trying to learn a different language model corresponding to its user. So they can be arbitrarily different. We also assume that each of these clients, the loss on it, it can also be written as a stochastic expectation. So this means that each client can have its own finite sum minimization problem or even more general problems and uh, desire to solve. And this makes sense because we can just say that each client has its own data set. And uh, we cannot centralize the data, so we cannot assume that we can just send these functions over to one server and do the optimization there due to privacy protection. The second regime is the identical data regime. And uh, this is a regime in which all of the clients have access to the same function. Now, this means that in a machine learning setting, uh, coming from empirical risk minimization, all of the clients are going to, sorry, uh, all of the clients are going to have access to the same data set. And uh, the clients can sample differently from the same data set, but they must have, they must be able to sample all of the points. Now, this can actually arise in distributed optimization when we consider the parameter server framework. I can just, for example, if I'm training a model on, say, uh, uh, a, a big uh, corpus of text, I can just uh, transmit the corpus at first to all of the clients and then to stop my optimization. But uh, it is not directly relevant to federated learning, but it can be insightful on its own into how useful are local steps, especially in a relatively simple setting in which all of the clients have access to the same function and we don't really have to think much about, okay, what are the problems that are introduced by uh, clients having very different objectives or very different, let's say, uh, writing styles if we're learning a, a language model. All right, so the algorithm that we describe right now, this mini batch SVT, it is a very simple baseline and it proceeds as follows. We have a server. Uh, the server broadcasts a point XT to all of its clients. For illustrative purposes here, there are just three clients, but they can be any number. And now each client uh, samples a local stochastic gradient. And uh, this local stochastic gradient, it will vary depending on whether, uh, like what regime we're in. So there are two regimes. And if the regime is the identical one, then in expectation, each local gradient represents just a random point drawn from the data set. So in expectation, it's, it approximates the full loss. Uh, but if the data is heterogeneous, this does not happen. And uh, the local stochastic gradient, it actually approximates just the loss on that node or that client. And then, after each client samples its local stochastic gradient, this can be seen, for example, for people familiar with neural networks, this is just uh, one forward pass. And then we um, send these uh, stochastic gradients back to the server, and the server then uh, performs averaging of these stochastic gradients and does one SGD update uh, of the form that is given. So here we just say xt plus one is equal to xt minus gamma times the average gradient uh, computed from these nodes. And uh, this turns out to be a pretty widely used method. Uh, it is easy to parallelize, easy to extend, uh, but we want a little more. All right, so in order to motivate the algorithm that uh, we are studying today, we find that we may rewrite the mini batch SVT update in the following way. And all of what I've done here is just move XT inside the aggregation, inside the average. 
So in this case, we may get a, an alternative interpretation of what stochastic gradient descent uh, with averaging and or mini-match SVB is doing, which is each client takes its own so-called local iterate, and then this is or can be sent back to the server, and then the server averages them. So it's as if on each client, we locally take one step of SGB, just normal SGB, nothing parallel about it. And then after doing that, we collect uh, these iterates and average them. And so this uh, gives us a natural question. What if we do multiple such steps? And uh, of course, we might ask why, and the reason is, uh, that we want to be as communication efficient as possible. See, because communication is prohibitively expensive, as I said, both in parameter server applications and in federated learning, or even more so in federated learning, we have to try to do our best to be communication efficient. So now I describe the local SGD algorithm. Uh, this is just drawn across time. And uh, each of these boxes represents the computation that is done locally on each client. So at first, the server broadcasts a point, which is x hat zero, and then each client uh, locally, it uh, does computation for t steps. And each of these steps is an SGD step, like one SGD update. So it samples a stochastic gradient at, uh, let's say, x11, and then it takes uh, an SGD update. So the superscript here, the top numbers, they represent uh, the client number. So x11 is uh, at time one on client one and xt1 is at time t on client one. And uh, we can do the same for the two other clients. And we make the assumption that we take at most h such local steps. So the, the number of local steps that we take is bounded, is upper bounded by H. And after we do this, so we take uh, T local steps uh, where T is smaller than H, we uh, send this to the server and then the server averages them and produces a new iterate X hat XT. All right, so the main idea here is very simple. We are doing just what local what, what mini batch SGD has done, but we have just extended the number of local steps. And this algorithm is super relevant to federated learning applications because it is at the heart of the federated averaging algorithm, which as far as I know is the most widely used one so far. So for federated averaging, you, you just have local SGD and then you add some things to it and you get there. But even this method is not really that well understood right now. All right, so after we do this, we have a new iterate. Now we can go back and start this process again, and it keeps repeating. All right, so does anyone have questions here? So let's, does this raising hand procedure, does this work for, for people? You can also alternatively type into the chat box. So I don't see any hands being raised. So some, someone could just try this uh, as an experiment so that we, we see it works. Yes, it works. So Yegor uh, raised the, his hand. Okay. All right. Good. So I think there's there's nothing at this point. Okay. So now we state the main problem that we're trying to solve in this work and our contribution. So our goal is we want to achieve the same training error. Uh, as so there is actually system. one. There's actually one question now from okay. Sahid and he's asking, I was wondering what age values H takes, capital uh, H. Okay, I mean, H can take any integer value. So one, two, three, until, um, you know, 
what you want because h is just the number of local steps and you are saying i'm just saying that it has to be upper bounded by by, by some finite number so you can't say for example i will uh, i don't know take h to be uh, larger than for example the total number of iterations i do and that is so far but we will see that in order to get convergence guarantees your h has to be bounded actually more tightly than that and we will get to that okay it's no more question oh there's another question samuel you're showing these uh, zoom group chats if you if that's you doing it okay great so we can all read it now are there known oh it disappeared so the question was, are there known impacts of scheduling training examples for these T-sized batches? Very sharp metal. Okay. Uh, these are not exactly T-sized batches. These are um, like for each of these, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's produced from the previous one. So it's not that we're taking a mini batch of size T, we are actually producing T different iterates. And I'm not sure I understand what scheduling training examples exactly mean. Because here we're just sampling stochastic gradients. Like we are choosing them uniformly uh, from a data set. Of course, you can have more uh, sophisticated uh, ways of choosing uh, samples, like, I don't know, uh, important sampling, but we don't really consider that. And. Okay, right. so it says it makes sense. And now unmuting Longsheng, who is asking a question. Okay, yeah, so no long chain. It should not be one gradient descent step because here uh, we are actually saying that you do SGD. So you do sample uh, as a stochastic gradient, an actual stochastic gradient. And it can be local. It, 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 like it, it can be a stochastic gradient of the local loss if you are dealing with heterogeneous data or it can be a stochastic gradient of the total loss if you're dealing with identical data. Okay, one more question by Arsani. So I'm going to unmute Arsani. I'm trying to do that now. Yes, Arsani, yes. you're un unmuted. Yes, so the question is, uh, what does T depend on in each client and is it the same on all clients or each client choose its own T? Okay, so, uh, what we do here is that we say that the T is the same for all clients. So for example, all of the clients agree that each of them will do 50 steps, for example. So they will take uh, T is equal to 50 and then they will, uh, uh, after 50 steps exactly, they will send their iterate to the server and they will wait for the server response. Uh, of course, you can consider the case in which uh, clients actually do it differently. So some clients take more steps than others. Uh, and applying our guarantee in that case will actually be for uh, like the, the H that upper bounds all of them. It will be a worst case bound. Uh, so for now, we, we just assume that it is fixed and the same, but it can be easily extended to the case that it is not uh, the same. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so feel free to continue. Okay. Okay, so the goal here is that we want to achieve the same training error as mini bench SGT, the same training error as our baseline, but with less communication rounds. So another way of stating this is we want to offload more work to uh, the local uh, realm. So we want computers to do more local work and to actually use that to offset communication because communication is more expensive than local computations. All right, so our contributions are in the heterogeneous data regime, we examine uh, the data similarity assumptions that are common in the literature. And we show that even for very simple function classes, these do not hold. So in a way, these are not really reasonable assumptions to make that can uh, capture what, uh, like, like the degree of unrelatedness that the functions can take in federated learning. And motivated by that, we obtain the first convergence guarantee for local SGT with arbitrarily hetero heterogeneous local losses. So this means that uh, we can consider 
very different functions that all just are convex and smooth. And uh, we show that local SVD works and that it is also communication efficient, at least in some setting of the parameter space. And uh, in the identical data regime, we show that much more dramatic communication savings are possible for both convex and strongly convex objectives. And the comparison point here is both the heterogeneous data regime. So we show that actually having identical data pays off. And uh, another comparison point is uh, previous work. So we show better guarantees than all previous papers. And in particular, uh, a somewhat surprising result is that for strongly convex objectives, the number of communications can be a constant independent of the total number of iterations. And by that, I mean that uh, you can af sometimes afford to only communicate a constant number of times, and that will be enough. So you can effectively offload most of the computation work on uh, local computers, on, uh, just make it all like mostly local and uh, you, you don't really have to communicate, let's say uh, a constant fraction out of the total number of iterations that you do. And the, this sort of result is a first. All right, so to summarize uh, some of the notation and also introduce some, we assume that you take a, a total number of iterations T. And by this, I mean the total number uh, like if you consider any one client, it will have taken T steps of SGD uh, combined with uh, communication steps. So T includes both communications and local computation. And H is the synchronization interval. And by this, I mean that H is the maximum number of local steps that you can do before you have to communicate again. And the number of communication steps is C. And uh, C can be seen, it, it is lower bounded by T over H. So it's the total number of iterations, take it divided by the synchronization interval, and you get a lower bound on the number of communication steps that you're going to do in the algorithm. All right, and the number of clients is M. So in the diagram, we drew them at three clients, but we consider the general space with M different clients. All right, so now we can begin discussing uh, the theory for heterogeneous data, and afterwards we will discuss theory for identical data. All right, so in this setting, uh, the objective that we're trying to minimize is this finite sum problem, which is we are trying to minimize the average of all the local functions. And we assume, uh, because our problem is convex, that there is uh, a single minimizer, which is x star. And uh, it, 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 the, we assume that there is at least one minimizer. So there can be multiple minimizers. And the theory that I'll present is uh, in the convex case, but it can be extended beyond convexity to strongly convex case. And in that case, you get, you get a better guarantee. So FM is the local loss function on node M. So FM represents whatever the data set that each node has access to. So each client has its own data set, and this data set is represented by FM. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, I'm peering here to see whether there's any questions here. I can see by Mohammed Al-Wakil. What is the gain of training a model in a distributed manner if the data are identical? So I'm oh, okay, sorry, I, I, I unmuted was, yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so this is a good question. And the thing is, uh, for example, you are uh, first in, in the parameter server uh, scenario, you are really limited by for the computational capabilities of each computer. So uh, let's say that you only have enough computation capabilities to do a mini batch of size, let's say 200 uh, for a large model. And uh, 
uh, for a mini batch size of, of, of size 200, you just can't uh, do more on a single machine. So in this case, using multiple machines can be beneficial. Uh, and this is actually standard because people usually, they, for example, for large uh, models, uh, they often involve multiple GPUs. So Mohamed, you are unmuted. Is this answering your question or you want to ask some follow-up question? Uh, it's okay for me. I was uh, asking about from the point of view of, of communication because Ahmed just said that uh, in communication, uh, overhead is most important than processing uh, uh, overhead. So if the data is identical, uh, all uh, the data, the training data should be available on the uh, all of the machines on all machines. So uh, we will do the communication to buzz the data. Uh, so the uh, uh, so this, this may be used in uh, two different cases. If we are limited in communication, uh, uh, or we are limited in computation, this is the point. Yeah, I mean, uh, like you are limited in some case by computation, by like the capabilities of memory, but you're not really limited by the capabilities of, let's say, how many uh, iterations that you can take. So. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a bit of a trade-off here. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, Zoltan, you are unmuted now. Uh, thank Hi, you. Zoltan. So, a uh, quick uh, clarification question on the previous uh, slide. Uh, when you defined your problem, you wrote uh, X is uh, part of RD, and you yes. were uh, mentioning uh, convex functions. So, uh, do you handle or are interested also in uh, when you have constraints on on the X, or is it included in F FM by taking these I don't infinite valued uh, functions? Uh, no, I like in order to handle constraints, uh, like convex require... constraints on X. Okay, so this would require adding a projection step, which yep. mm -hmm. we do not do explicitly in the paper, but which I don't think is difficult to add. So you can even, I would say, it's not difficult to extend the theory that is in the paper to the case when you have uh, proximal operators that you apply, which are more general than, than projection operators. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm unmuting Sahid. Uh, is it working? Yes, so yeah. now, now you're <coughs> unmuted. All right, thank you. Uh, so I just I was just wondering on this slide, um, you're taking um, average of the local models, right? And um, you're not, this is not um, considering the uh, number of data points held by uh, by each client or each mode. So I, you, this is just taking. It's, this is assuming that each of the clients have the same number of data points, right? No, no, we don't. Uh, we don't need that because see here we are saying that uh, uh, f is equal to the average uh, on each client, but we didn't specify what, like uh, how many data points are in each fm. So. We actually said that FM can be a stochastic, of, like a, a stochastic expectation. So this means that FM can have a, gen, a very general form, and it can be uh, the the number of data points can vary uh, on any node. So uh, we 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 don't require that the number of data points on each of the nodes be equal. So there's one more question. Tin Duan is asking, can you remind what is heterogeneity? Okay, so uh, we say that data is heterogeneous if uh, each client has access to its own data set that is different from the one that is on other clients. So here in the definition shown in this slide, we say that f of x is equal to 1 over m summation m, f m of x, and each client, the mth client, has access only to f m. It does not see the other functions. Uh, when you have identical data, which is not the heterogeneous regime, uh, each uh, client will have access to F. Does that answer your question? So I didn't manage to unmute 10, but I think this, this was okay. So let's, let's proceed. All right. Okay, so there is actually a lot of work on this algorithm. And there is uh, early work since 1995 by all the 
um, Mangasaryan, in which he considered the asymptotic convergence of the algorithm. And uh, more recently, there has been a lot of interest in this algorithm motivated by federated learning and, uh, and, and, and distributed optimization in general. So there's this paper by Vasu, Data, Krakos, and Tikapi, uh, in which they consider local SGD, but also with quantization and uh, many other perks. And there's also this paper by Kao Yu and uh, Sen Yang and Chen Chu Zhu. And uh, this was actually in AAAI 2019. And it, uh, they also show that there is uh, a benefit to using local SGD. But both of the two papers rely on a certain bounded gradients assumption that we will get to. But it, it, it will be seen that it is a bit problematic for modeling uh, data heterogeneity in federated learning. So there's also, uh, there are also other papers. So for example, there's a paper by Wang, Tour, Salonidis, Makaya, Hei, and Chan, which is when edge meets learning, adaptive control for resource constraint distributed machine learning, in which they also consider uh, local SGD or local GD. And uh, there's also Ken Chiang and Gagan Agrawal in a linear speed of analysis of distributed deep learning. And both of them, they also show some communication benefits to using the algorithm, but they rely on a certain bounded dissimilarity assumption, uh, which we'll also get to. And there is uh, more work. Uh, for example, there's this uh, Thich Huang, Yang, Wang and Chang uh, paper on the convergence of federated averaging with non-identical data. And this one actually considers the, the more uh, general case of federated averaging, which allows for client sampling and actually allows for, uh, uh, let's say, more complicated uh, algorithms. Like local SGD is a special case, but it is at the heart of the method. All right, I apologize for that part. <laughs> okay, so there is also a second paper, uh, which is uh, from current work, Farzin uh, Khamitpur and Mehdad Mahdabi which also considered the convergence of local descent method, and they obtain a lot of nice results for non-complex objectives under a certain bounded diversity assumption. Uh, but our focus here is on the convex case and without uh, assumptions of bounded similarity or diversity. So now we get to the bounded dissimilarity assumption, and this states that the gradient on each node is not too far from the total gradient, for all points in the input space. So uh, this is maybe a lot to digest, but this is just intuitively saying that you can always bound the difference uh, between the different functions across these nodes. And for one thing, uh, you have to bound this on all of the input space. So these functions, they have to be universally similar. They can't be, uh, like they, they can't be similar only locally, you need this on all of the space. So this condition is, uh, let's say, too strong because we can consider a simple one-dimensional quadratic. So now this function is a very simple function. It's just some constant multiplied by x squared over two. And am here is just a, a positive constant. And applying, uh, this definition of fm and f to uh, this uh, uh, difference of gradients, we see that uh, this average difference that is required to be bounded by the bounded dissimilarity condition uh, decomposes into this constant term uh, multiplied by x squared, where x here is uh, the model. So clearly, we can make this as large as we want, and it is going to contradict uh, the assumption that this dissimilarity is bounded. So this is the first problem here. And uh, we would like to have guarantees that can hold not just for these quadratics, but it is more preferable to have guarantees that hold locally, because if they hold locally, uh, they can be easily checked, at least in theory, and uh, they can also uh, maybe be shown to, to, to be satisfied for more than just quadratics. 
So there is a second assumption that is also popular in the literature, which is the bounded gradients assumption. And uh, here we just assume that all the gradients are uh, on average bounded by certain constant. And this is, a, the first problem with this assumption is, is, is that it is a special case of bounded dissimilarity, but without really the benefit uh, that we gain from that. So that's problem one. And problem two is that it is actually in contradiction with global strong convexity. So you cannot have a function that is strongly convex and also uh, globally satisfies uh, this bounded gradients condition. So there is this paper by Lan Huyen, uh, Hao Huyen, Van Tyck, and uh, Peter Richterich, and Katy Scheinberg, and Martin Tatach, uh, SV and Hogwell convergence without the bounded gradients assumption, in which they, they show uh, this fact. So the third problem is uh, this assumption is also has quite questionable applicability to practice. And by this, I mean that there is an algorithm uh, that has a proof of convergence when this assumption is satisfied, but both in practice and uh, with very specific examples, it can be shown that this algorithm will diverge. So it is questionable just how relevant this assumption is when we're trying to apply it to functions that may not satisfy. So the main point here is that uh, in prior work, there are no results that apply to arbitrarily heterogeneous data and that we might have uh, many conditions that are uh, a bit too strong. So now we give our alternative, which is uh, we build our theory on the following quantity, which we call sigma diff or the variance at the optimum. So here we just say, okay, we look at the magnitude of the stochastic gradient, the expected magnitude of the stochastic gradient on each node at only one point, which is X star. And now we have a local guarantee. It's just a single point. And uh, this is easily verified to be finite. And uh, there is no contradiction with quadratics in the same way. So there is this nice paper by Ki Jiang and Xiang Yao Li, in which uh, they show that when this quantity is zero, uh, we do get the past convergence of gradient assumption. And our results can be seen as uh, a generalization of this. So now we state our main theorem, and it looks scary, but uh, it, it is not that scary, really. So here we show that uh, the distance, like the, the functional distance from the optimum, it, uh, after t steps, it satisfies the following bound. So it is smaller than uh, four R node squared over gamma T, where R node is the initial distance to the optimum. So it is how far your starting point was from the optimum. And uh, we see that we have a term that depends on H. And uh, I remind you that H was the synchronization interval. And our guarantee is in terms of the average iterate. And uh, for strongly convex objectives, it's uh, in terms of the final iterate. So the average iterate can be obtained uh, easily by just keeping averaging uh, locally in each node and then sending the final average to, uh, to the average of the survey. And the number of nodes is M and we see that the first term, it, uh, it decreases with the number of nodes. So having more nodes is helping us in this term. And L is the smoothness constant and the condition and the step size is here and it is relatively standard. All right, so let's try it again more inside a bit. So this convergence guarantee actually decomposes into two terms. The first term is exactly the same as mini batch SGD up to some constants. And the second term is an additive error that we can control by controlling the relative size of the synchronization interval H with the noise. So a very easy result is that if the noise is zero, then we just get fast convergence. So the point here is we uh, have an error guarantee that is the same as many batch SGD. We just have to deal with an extra error term that will force us to not choose H too large, that will force us to communicate more, to take uh, fewer local steps. So it can be shown that we can guarantee that we can reach an error of size epsilon, which means that the function can be at most epsilon distance from the optimum if we take the following number of communication uh, iterations. 
So C is the number of communication steps. And uh, we can see that it depends on the initial distance of the optimum and the smoothness constant, the synchronization interval, the number of clients. And now we can compare this quantity against mini batch SGD. So this is the communication complexity of local SGD. And it's still not clear exactly how this fares against mini batch SGD. So in order to compare, we consider the case in which epsilon is very small. So you want to drive your accuracy almost to zero. You want to actually optimize your function and get something that is very close to the optimum in terms of quality of solution. So in this case, uh, the communication complexity for local SGD uh, becomes this, uh, ep like it varies with epsilon power negative three over two, while mini batch SGD varies with epsilon power negative two. So this means that mini batch SGD will require more communication steps as a function of the accuracy than local SGD in order to reach the same error. And uh, this is exactly uh, the, the, the goal that we set out on doing. And the difference between them will be on order of one over square root of epsilon, which can be large if epsilon is very small. So are there any questions here? So there is, there's a question by Teng Don. So I'll try to unmute. Uh, let me find Teng in the list. Yes, so I'm unmuting you right now. Yes, please go ahead and ask your question. So uh, do you think the dependence on H, the synchronization interval, can be improved to uh, order one or uh, the quadratic you have right now is tight. Okay, so in the case of uh, heterogeneous data, uh, no, I think uh, the, the, the quadratic dependence, I don't think that can be improved. But if you do have identical data, then it can be improved to a linear dependence and we do that. So at least for a local SGD, as far as I know, uh, quadratic is the best uh, that has been shown so far. But for, for, for identical data, you can actually get it to order one. You can get it to a linear term, and I will show that. So basically, H can be considered as part of the variance due to the heterogeneity. Right? Um, no, because see, uh, there, there is a, an actual variance term here, and uh, like, uh, see, the, there is a, a, a term that is uh, already uh, clean of H, uh, which is the first term, the one that is the same as mini-batch SGD. H only matters in this additive term. And yes, it is multiplied by the variance, but uh, I wouldn't say that it is part of the variance or the only part. Okay, thank you. All right. I don't see any further questions, so. Okay, let's continue. So, as I said, the main thing here is that we basically are getting a reduction in the number of communications and they're doing it for free. Okay, so we can actually uh, attain an optimal number of synchronization interval and uh, this, uh, we, we can derive it in the following way. So, uh, the derivation is not here, it is in the paper, but uh, the total communication complexity ends up being this minimum of t and t power three over four times n power negative three over four. So at least in some setting of the parameter space, uh, some relation between the total number of iterations that you will do and the number of clients, uh, local SGD does give you an improvement in communication. So here are sample experimental results and they do show that while the more local steps that you take, for example, here 32, you, you achieve a much higher error. On the other hand, you require fewer communication rounds to, to reach the same error. So there is kind of a trade-off here and it is what is shown by our theoretical results. And here M was 20. There are also other experiments that vary the number of clients in the paper. So now we move on to the theory of identical data and uh, I remind you that the setting here is that now each client has access to the full function. It can sample it differently, but each client has access to its own function. 
And we assume. So there's a question by Nati Srebro. I unmuted you, okay. Nati. Yeah. Thanks. Go Sorry, ahead. it took me a while to find. I was clapping, so of raising my hand. So, uh, <laughs> is, um, this is half a question, half a comment, but um, instead of doing local SVD to reduce communication, you could just use lo larger mini batch, right? So use, if you have M machines, you can accumulate T times M examples with it, and, and also by that reduce communication. Right? And I don't know if you want to say something about how, um, uh, how that option compares here. I don't, um, or, uh, or maybe, I mean, I, I should say that uh, Blake will be talking next week also about that, but um, I don't know if you want to mention here how, um, how that comes in. Okay, so because here we are comparing against SGD as in we take mini batch SGD with mini batch size M and we do it for T steps. So uh, this is uh, li like the reduction at least in the variance term as far as I know would be the same, but uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure. So I would need to look more into, into this, into the comparison with this other baseline. Yeah. Okay, okay, so Blake will talk about it next week, but I think that, I mean, just lo looking, lo again, it seems that it's not occurring with this bound, it's not giving benefit over just using larger mini batch, reducing communication by using larger mini batch. So, okay, okay, thanks. Okay, I don't see further hands raised or questions, so keep going. All right, so the quantity of interest here is the variance of the optimum. And now it is just defined to be according to the sampling. And uh, because we allow the sampling in each node to be different, we have to get this sum. If all of the sampling uh, distributions on the nodes are the same, then we, we would just be getting one term, which is the expected uh, nabla f of x star given z, where z is uh, the source of randomness. Okay, and uh, we, in this case, we will also present results for new strongly complex functions. Like uh, here, we, our paper actually did both of these. All right, so uh, there is this very nice paper that was uh, pioneering in this, uh, in the analysis of this algorithm by Sebastian Stief, which is uh, local SGD converges fast and we think it's little. And, um, this paper. I should. I, I. I. want to say that Sebastian is here, uh, okay. in the audience. Hi, Sebastian. How are you? I'm unmuting you. Just a hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hey. Hello. How are you? All right. So. Yeah. Um, in this paper. Uh, which, as I said, uh, has actually uh, been very influential in starting this line of work. Uh, Sebastian shows that the com communication complexity that is required to reach the same error as mini batch SGD is this uh, square root of kappa mt, where kappa is the condition number, which is the smoothness constant divided by the strong complexity constant, uh, m is the number of clients, and t is uh, the total number of iterations that you will take. Uh, this also was done under some rather restrictive assumptions. Okay, so there are several issues, and one of them is we don't really get that one-shot averaging converges. And by one-shot averaging, I mean you just do uh, t steps on each node, and then you average at the end. And uh, this should converge if you have identical data. It should basically be only as good as uh, just doing it on one node or at least uh, as, as good as that, uh, because uh, we, when you average by Jensen's inequality, your solution will never get worse. So here, the number, the required number of communications grows with the total number of iterations. And uh, at the time of uh, writing the paper, there were no results also for convex, but not strongly convex objectives. So now the question is, can we improve this? And the guarantee that we show is uh, the following. Uh, in which, again, we have two terms, the first of which is the same as mini batch SGD, and the second is an error term whose size can be controlled by controlling the size of the synchronization interval H. 
So now uh, here, the, the convergence depends as usual on the strong convexity constant mu. And as I said, this is the same as mini-batch SVT, but we also get extra dependence on the condition number in the error term. And this is problematic because for ill-conditioned problems, this can be very bad. All right, so in order to interpret this result, we may simply uh, try to make the term, the additive error, uh, smaller than simply the variance that comes from uh, mini-batch SVD. So we try to say that this error term can be made smaller than this uh, mini-batch SVD term. And uh, when we do that, uh, we get that the optimal synchronization interval is this one plus t over kappa n. And now if the problem is ill-conditioned, this will just be one, but if the problem has good conditioning relative to the number of iterations, uh, this will be actually uh, larger than one. So in this case, the communication complexity that we will get is this minimum of t and kappa n. And here we just can say that the number of communications can be constant. So uh, this is pretty surprising because it tells you that uh, in some cases at least uh, you can afford to only communicate a constant number of times. This might be large still, but uh, it is still something. And to show that our result also solves uh, some of these other problems, we, if we put h is equal to t plus one, which corresponds to one shot averaging, basically you take the synchronization interval as large as your, uh, uh, your, your horizon of computation, then you get this guarantee, which is sigma squared kappa over nu squared t. And we say that this is an improvement of our prior work, but still not optimal because just a, a trivial use of Jensen's inequality is going to yield a better convergence guarantee of sigma squared over nu squared t. So there is room for improvement here. And this also extends to uh, the convex but not strongly convex case. And uh, this actually answers the question of uh, of thin. So uh, you asked if, if the dependence on H can be improved from quadratic. And in fact, it can be, uh, at least in the case where you have identical data, and uh, this is what we have here. So here we have exactly the same thing, but the error term, uh, we replace the quadratic h squared by uh, this linear h. And in fact, the, the, there is a big difference between uh, this, these two results and the proof technique that results from them, and you can see that in the paper. So of course, Thank this you, translates, Amit. you're welcome. So of course, this translates to more communication savings for the convex case. All right. So, uh, there is another nice paper by Sebastian Stich and uh, Saifani Kalibretti, uh, which is this error feedback framework that already... And I should say this, that, that Sai is here as well. Uh, hi. Okay. So let me try to unmute you so that we can at least say hi to each other. Uh, where are you? Ah, here. I'm unmuting. Hello. Hi, uh, hi Peter. Hello. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Thanks for organizing this. Um... All right. All right. So there is this nice paper that is on the error feedback framework, but also happens to have uh, results for local SVD. And uh, it actually, many of the same results were obtained concurrently, but they also use a different proof technique, a different weighting scheme, a different step size. And uh, some of the similarities and differences are discussed in our paper. All right, so here are the experimental results. And here we see that more more local steps directly translate to uh, both smaller uh, error and also fewer communication steps. So we can see that uh, there is actually, this was on a strongly complex problem, on a logistic regression problem on 20 nodes. And we see that uh, there are a lot more benefits to using local SVD for identical data. All right, so are there any questions here? So I'm trying to look for 
hands raised or comments at the moment i don't see i don't see anything ah so there is one from long shank so let me try to unmute long shank there you go okay i, be so... I believe you are unmuted are you all right, so he's asking how to set synchronization time steps uh, stochastically or fixed in advance. So you can do both. If you set them stochastically, you get this loopless method. And there is a paper about it, which I will mention. Uh, if you set them uh, in advance, uh, then you can also, like, this is the method that we study. And you, you sort of have to set them in advance such that they satisfy that they are never really uh, uh, far from each other by more than h. So. You agree beforehand that you, each node will do no more than 50 local steps, and this is what you use. OK, I don't see any further questions. All right, so now we get to some open questions, or things that others have done. And the first is the thing that uh, uh, Natiya was mentioning, <laughs> and this will be spoken about next week. So there's this nice paper in which uh, they consider uh, this uh, different baseline. And they show that, uh, in fact, uh, if you consider more carefully the error guarantee that we give for general complex objectives, then uh, you can do better. So you actually get the same sort of guarantee that has to do with H, but you have to optimize more carefully over the step size in order to get a better result. So I've unmuted Blake. Hello, Blake, since we're in the business of greeting uh, people we mentioned. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? All right. So also there is uh, this other paper that is for heterogeneous data, which does consider using client sampling and also uses a very nice trick of using two step sizes. And uh, this is by Cypernit Karim Reddy, Sachin Kell, Marielle Mori, Sasha Mkredi, Sebastian Stich, and Ananda Suresh. And uh, the paper is entitled about scaffold, but actually it also includes an analysis of federated averaging. And uh, they show that some better results are obtained if you can use these two step sizes thing. All right, so there are actually uh, other interesting questions, which is- uh, We have uh, one extra question by by kumar i i can unmute him and you can ask yourself hi so i was curious about your uh, strongly convex experience which is short for logistic regression did you try something similar for like least square regression and uh, were the plots more similar than different and was hyperparameter tuning more uh, relevant there so thanks Okay, I think all of the problems that we tried were logistic regression problems. So unfortunately, we did not really have to deal with least squares regression, at least as far as I remember. We might have done it, but I think the experiments in the paper were mostly in logistic regression, but with different data sets and different regularization. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so Kumar actually also wrote a paper on local SVD which uh, deals more specifically with uh, uh, like this, this characterization, the second order characterization of the error, which I also think is quite nice. All right, so now we have this uh, uh, other question, which is, uh, is there another point of view which we, from which we can see local methods because all of the point of view that I've given is from communication efficiency. Is this communication efficient or not? And in fact, as uh, recent papers have shown, it might not actually always be communication efficient. It might not actually be always the best method to use. So there are actually alternative ways or places which we might look for uh, to see why are people, why is federated averaging so popular? Why are people using it? And one of these is the meta-learning point of view. So there's this uh, paper by Yi Han Jiang, Jakob Konichnik, and Kate Hush, and Sri Ram Kenan, in which they show that you can actually write federated averaging as some sort of combination of uh, mammal uh, style methods. And there is this other paper that more directly handles personalization by Philip Hansley and Peter Lichtoik, that it is federated learning of a mixture of global and local models. 
in which they consider a model that is uh, an algorithm that's quite like localized really. All right, so are there any questions? <laughs>